difficulty of constructing a system of justification for the use of coercive force by the state probably does not cause the average citizen any great distress. It might be the source of momentary contemplation during an idle afternoon, or occasionally become the subject of debate if one happens to befriend an anarchist. Yet, the matter is not trivial, nor is it resolved, despite the widespread celebration of our Constitution. The states are ubiquitous. Their reach extends over every habitable landmass on the globe. The question of whether the state is justified in using coercion is one all persons might legitimately ask themselves. For the purposes of optimism, I will begin with the assumption that there is, at least in principle, some way to justify the state and its use of coercive force, force. The resulting model of political justification may, as I predict it probably will, preclude many existing states in the world from claiming to be justified in all the acts of coercion in which they routinely engage. However, to begin with the assumption that states and their attendant exercise of coercive force are unjustifiable in principle leaves us in the lamentable position of concluding that the noble political ideals of our American founders are mere fantasy, and any attempt to construct a system of political justification is pure vanity. I hope you find such a theory as unsatisfactory as I do, because the thesis of this essay is quite the opposite. If states are justifiable, and this is by no means the consensus of the philosophical community, then the next question becomes, how? Most Americans, following the founders, conceive of political justification in terms of consent. That is to say, that we believe the state's use of force is acceptable because we have in some way agreed to it, whereby our agreement authorizes the state to act as it does. The coherence of the consent model hinges on the recognition of individual freedom as the fundamental moral interest of all persons. Unsurprisingly, the consent model's popularity and vigor stem from emphasizing personal liberty, an idea in perfect alignment with the American psyche. The consent model is especially important to our political history because of the tremendous importance of John Locke's political writings to the founders. Locke, who perhaps exerted more influence over the creation of the U.S. Constitution than any other political philosopher, begins chapter 8 of his second treatise on government in the following way. Men be, as has been said, by nature, all free, equal, and independent. No one can be put out of this estate and subjected to the political power of another without his own consent. The significance of individual freedom to both Locke and the founders is evident in our flagship political documents, but as appealing as the method of consent is to our society, it is nonetheless effective. Consent-based models of political justification are myriad, and I do not intend to examine them all. Instead, I will briefly discuss what I believe to be the most critical weaknesses of explicit consent, as well as those of a permutation called tacit consent that was intended to overcome the inadequacies of explicit consent. Generally speaking, my criticisms will focus on the failure of both explicit and tacit consent to fulfill background conditions necessary for them to be meaningful actions capable of justifying the state. After illustrating how consent is deficient for the purposes of justifying the use of coercive force by the state, I intend to sketch an alternative model based not on consent, but teleological considerations. The word teleology comes from the Greek telos, meaning end or goal. One helpful way to grasp the difference between consent-based models and teleological models is to characterize consent as a backward-looking method and theology as a forward-looking method. Consent to the state occurs first, and then the state is justified based on the prior consent of citizens. A, tele a teleological model, uh, by contrast, justifies the state by reference to how the state operates and whether it accomplishes specific ends, but without regard for citizen consent. Note that in jettisoning consent, I do not intend to devalue individual freedom, and my alternative will strive to incorporate protections for individual freedom to as large a degree as possible. If we consider our own society for a moment, the first problem that may come to mind with regard to consenting to the state's authority is that nobody does it. Naturalized citizens notwithstanding, this is the first significant failure of consent. It has not been practiced. But let us set that aside momentarily and imagine a hypothetical situation wherein the mechanism did exist to collect explicit consent to the state from all adult citizens. Notice that in this hypothetical America, 
the result of dissent would be indistinguishable from the result of consent. The fact is that the state, in exercising its coercive power, does not distinguish between those persons who have consented and those who have not. Nor could it, without compromising the integrity and the viability of the state itself. Thus, any persons wishing to both dissent to the state and remain free from state coercion must emigrate. One of the background conditions of meaningful consent is that it is freely given. This entails that the consequences of both consent and dissent be roughly equivalent in the costs they impose. However, the costs of consenting to the state and the costs of leaving the state are so unbalanced as to render the choice between them no choice at all. What is worse, even persons who wanted to consent to the state could never justify it so long as dissent imposed an undue cost. The inadequacy of explicit consent is overwhelming. In response to this shortcoming, consent theorists put forward the idea of tacit consent so as to retain the method but evade the criticisms of explicit consent. The argument goes that a person can meaningfully consent to the state through a deliberate action that is nonetheless not explicit consent. Examples that have been offered as constituting this kind of tacit consent include the use of state roads or infrastructure, simply residing within the nation's territory, or voting on referenda, or electing members of government. Tacit consent is an appreciably augmented version of the consent-based model of political justification. In order to suitably demonstrate how it, too, fails to live up to necessary background conditions, it is advantageous to draw on A.J. Simmons, Commonwealth Professor of Philosophy at the University of Virginia, and a prominent proponent of the consent method, and his enumeration of five criteria that all meaningful tacit consent fulfills. Imagine the following example of valid and therefore binding tacit consent. The president of a board of directors wants to reschedule the next week's meeting and asks the board members if there are any objections to the schedule change. If no one voices an objection, that is, if each person tacitly consents by remaining silent, then the president is justified in changing the meeting time, something he is not normally empowered to do, because he has been given this right by the consent of the board members. The first three conditions found in this example of working tacit consent are firstly, that each person is aware of what is happening. Secondly, that each person understands or is informed of the appropriate means of expressing dissent and that there is a period of time definite and reasonable in length during which he or she may do so. And thirdly, that the point after which dissent is no longer acceptable must be obvious or made clear to each person. These first three conditions ensure that the silence of the board members is significant and not the result of ignorance about the nature of the situation or the procedures required for expressing dissent. If we take another look at the actions consent theorists suggest constitute tacit consent to the state, voting, taking up residence, and making use of public works such as roads, and then apply to them Simmons' first three conditions, it is plain that, at least as things stand in our society, meaningful tacit consent is not taking place. When people vote, or use the road system, or live here, they do not attach special significance to these actions. If they are unaware that they are tacitly consenting, then the tacit consent is not binding and cannot confer a justification on the state's use of force of force. However, the failure of tacit consent in this country to fulfill Simmons' first three conditions is only incidental and might be remedied simply by notifying citizens that certain actions will signify tacit consent to the state. However, Simmons' final two conditions differ from the first three, which are merely conditions requiring awareness, and lead to a more severe problem for tacit consent. The final two conditions are one, that the method of demonstrating one's dissent is both reasonable and easily performed, and two, that the consequences of dissent must not be harmful to the potential consenter. Within the board meeting example, cases that do not meet the final two conditions are not difficult to envision. One particularly vivid image that Simmons supplies involves the board president requiring dissenting members to lock their arms off if they want to demonstrate an objection to the new board meeting <laughs> When the final two conditions are applied to residents, voting, and using infrastructure, the decisive blow against tacit consent is delivered. In addition to surrendering their rights to vote, any persons wishing to dissent would be required to emigrate and to do so without using any roads or infrastructure. This alternative to consent is neither reasonable nor easily performed, and it is most certainly harmful, especially inasmuch as the dissenters would have to leave behind much valuable property, their homeland, and the people they love.